we're going to watch a series of silent films devoted to the theme of the automobile. From the beginning, cinema had a fascination with technology, and you know that the first film that was shown by the Lumiere brothers of Lyon was about a train arriving in the station. Later on, and this is especially true for the films we will watch today, the first of, of, of which is from 1905, the automobile was included in films that were especially popular and that were based heavily on special effects. So the car was an exotic prop that was ideal for this kind of movies called trick movies or trick films, where trick is the word that was used at that time to indicate a special effect. effect. Most of these movies, as it was common during that time, are only a few minutes long. The longest might be 10 minutes. And in fact, especially if you go online and you look for these films on a variety of digital platforms, you will find different lengths from the same video. Because oftentimes, especially modern people, contemporary uh, users, tend to slow down these films to bring them to the speed, the pace that they're familiar with in today's movies or TV. And I recommend, especially for some of these films, that you set the speed, and we'll do it today, at 115, 120, 125 per. So what you see oftentimes on YouTube or other platforms is something that has been actually slowed down compared to the original. Sometimes the films will have a soundtrack, often though these soundtracks are not original, were lost and were replaced with some period pieces that pay, that really don't, don't do a good service because, as you know, in theater they would have had musicians, at the very least a piano player. And the piano player, in most instances, would have adapted from his repertoire, would have adapted the choice of music to the kind of scene that was being played. Keegan, you have a question? Yeah, um, why is it slowed down on the video files that we're going to be watching? Is there like a because, yeah, it's a matter of taste. So modern day people tend to find silent films ridiculous because of their quick pace, which was in fact a, a, a result, the outcome, of the technology, the uh, camera that were being used and the pace of that camera, it was also often an intentional choice because these were supposed to be comedies and speed was associated with comedy in a variety of genre that were popular in theaters, the so-called vaudeville theater or the uh, comedies known as farces, okay? And you'll notice yourself when you watch these movies when the speed is right, because yes, some of them include what was called the slapstick comedy. So physical comedy that is highly choreographed. So every movement has been tried as like a ballet, comical, ballet, but then they may have quiet scene. And you can see that if you watch them at the regular speed that is offered by uh, a, a particular YouTube channel, it becomes completely unnatural. And, and so you can understand uh, what I mean. All of these films are available uh, freely, uh, usually on YouTube sometimes. You can find them on other platforms uh, as well, specialized platforms, uh, etc. I will introduce each uh, briefly, and you find notes here and excerpts 
uh, from Wikipedia to give you, to provide basic information about the director, some of the actors, the plot, uh, etc. After the introduction, we will watch each of these films. And of course, if there are questions and comments, we can pause in between films. In any case, I, uh, uh, I want you to, either today or later on, you don't have to spoil your viewing now, post some comments, some reactions on your Google Docs file. They can be very uh, simple, just to show that you were paying attention and that you noticed some specific details in the characters, in the plot, in the visual style that was significant. You don't have to provide comments for all of these films. Let your interest and your reactions guide your choice, really. It's up to you, there is no proper format. I haven't reviewed past participation activity notes for the last two assignments yet, but this will be my job between now and next Thursday which is the next time we are in class because of the fall break. Okay. So, let's talk about the first of these movies, which is also one of the greatest on the automobile. As you can see in here, it was partially colored by hand, which made it, of course, very expensive. And the English version, because the film was produced in France but became very popular in the US as well, was an adventurous automobile trip. The director is one of the pioneers, one of the most brilliant filmmakers, one of the pioneers of uh, cinema, Georges Méliès, and the final version was produced and circulated in 1905, but there was a previous version in 1904, which was an interesting hybrid performance. That is to say, in 1904, they only had some of the 12 scenes that were found in the final version, because some of the scenes, especially the introduction and the conclusion, were being replaced by an actual theatrical performance on stage with actors. So that's why I called it a hybrid performance. They would perform some of the scenes live in front of an audience. Then they would show some of the other scenes from the film. Since it was pretty successful and they couldn't export the actors, have them go on tour in the US, they made the full version as a, um, as, as a standing film, but you will see that, for example, the first scene that we will watch, which is not the first scene in the film because some of the scenes, some of the film went lost, was clearly shot in a theater on the stage. Other scenes were shot in a studio. One of the scenes was shot in the garden of the director and producer. And you can see actually the grass at the bottom of the scene. As I said, you find here quite a few notes. I'll, I'll just explain a few things before watching this so just to add just a few things about the director the director was always constantly trying to innovate his <clears throat> techniques and as it was the case for this film it, he ended up producing films that were too expensive and no matter how successful they were they were losing money in order to continue to produce films, he would produce more films, try to produce as many uh, films as possible every week. Sometimes he could shoot more than a hundred films 
per year, trying to get an advance on future profits, selling the copyrights to his films, signing eventually, as he did, uh, a, a honor, an onerous contract with Pate, uh, promising to produce for them an extraordinary and impossible number of films until when he couldn't deliver and the relationship with the production company that owned uh, the director and his products soured. He just refused to collaborate with them, was taken to trial, when eventually he lost the trial, he himself burned a lot of his films. So between the damages that came with time, especially the war, during the war, uh, one of his homes was used in the countryside of France, was used by the French army and they destroyed themselves. Some of the film and his own self-destruction uh, of, of the films, that's why we don't have uh, so many, most of his films. And for some, like this one, we don't have the complete film. We don't have all the scenes, which uh, would have been on different roles of film. So it's trick film, meaning it's based on special effects. And it's also a comedy or a farce. A farce is a grotesque kind of comedy. You can see it through the pace, the rhythm of the narrative, which is incense, incessant, right? Uh, very, very quick. And the technique of the amplification, that is to say when there is a gag, something that is supposed to make the public laugh, then it's it is expanded and amplified and, and exaggerated as much as possible. So we know it had about a dozen scenes. <coughs> Nine of them are in the video that will be shown. The first scene was uh, that, that we see here uh, is outside the Paris House, a theater, where the departure of King Leopold II of Belgium takes place, he being the driver of this sports car that is supposed to take him from Paris to the French Riviera, from Paris to Monte Carlo in just two hours. So in the one or two scenes that were lost before what is number one here, you would have seen the king expressing his intention to visit the French Riviera, complaining that trains or any other mode of transportation would take too long to go from Paris to the Riviera, and then being alerted that there is an inventor visiting the inventor of this new extremely fast car and agreeing uh, on a deal to get the car and use this car to go in just two hours from Paris to the Mediterranean. In the second scene that we have in the video, we see the first pit stop. Of course, it's a great distance. The car has to stop for refuel. That was expected even in dreamlike technology. So they stop at a garage. The king himself is refueling the car with the help of mechanics. They're surrounded by people who are, of course, are, are interested in this mm, technological marvel. And because of the confusion when the car is about to leave the garage, instead of putting the low gear, which would be first gear now, they put the, uh, uh, they, they go backwards and they uh, hit a policeman, which ends up being completely flattened. And you'll see um, in this scene and then multiple times in the other films, the constant use of the stopgap or substitution splicing technique, whereby they would shoot a scene, then stop, make changes to the scene's setup. For example, replace the policeman who's fallen to the ground with a puppet or some other kind of prop then continue to shoot the scene. Then, of course, because they were 
very good at this, they would adjust this to perfection while editing so that you cannot see the moment that the car is, is in, in the next scene or the policeman's body is being replaced, although you usually see uh, the people gathering around to cover, uh, to mask the effect they uh, gather around the car itself. Next, we see the car going up and down the French hill. They hit a, an old guy who's the local mailman, who might have been the director himself. He played a couple of parts in the film. Then they're crossing the Alps. And by the way, scene number three, they don't even use the wooden car, the wooden model they used in the car. They don't use a real car in the film. It's like an animated movie, scene number three. They are crossing the Alps or, or similar mountains. They get to Dijon and Outside of Dijon, they find the gates and they find the custom officers. It was customary during that period in places such as France to have to stop before you entered a major metropolitan area. And the custom officers would ask you if you were bringing anything in or out that had any commercial value. If so, they would charge you. You would have to pay a fee. So we see the custom officers and the car pushes uh, his way into the, the city gate uh, and an officer with a prominent belly tries to stop the car until the belly explodes. Then they're on, uh, they, they come upon a, an open air market and they crash all the stalls and there is a brawl, a big brouhaha that follows after the car is left. Then they're inside some kind of French town. They're scaring the people there. They crash through gates and go above the roofs, fall into a courtyard, disrupting the activities of this nice town. In the next scene, which is the one shot in the garden, they're trying to put tar on the grass. They're trying to put asphalt on the grass, which of course is not something you should do. First you put gravel, then you put asphalt. But they're doing this. The car arrives, of course, the tar car explodes because it's all special effect. Next scene, they finally arrive in Monte Carlo. They crash into the stands, go into the air, fall back, and then finally the king and his mechanician get out of the car and they're greeted by the people waiting for them there they are uh, welcomed there, okay? Why the King of Belgium as the protagonist? Well, the King of Belgium was uh, often in the newspapers, was considered to be uh, someone who had a, a daring personality, a hunter uh, who did horrible things to animals in Africa. He did horrible things to humans in Africa for that matter. It was. The, the head of a colonialist empire of the time. So the idea is to have in real life or as a character, celebrities and stars. Even in the first scene at the opera, you can see some famous artists from the period and other celebrities. Because as I said, they would be called to the theater and they would act as bait. They were trying to sell more tickets because people wanted to see these, these, these guys, these celebrities, okay? So you find more information about King Leopold here and other references. In, in fact, it is true that during that period there were tire in the streets in Monaco. Asphalt was, was the new thing now that they had more, uh, more uh, car going over that. The Folies Bergère was this famous theater in Paris uh, where they set up the hybrid performance and they shot at least the first scene. This is where you can see, even from the light, you can see that this is an actual garden that they're outside. And you can see that this is simply a wooden model that is being pushed. It's vaguely reminiscent of a Renault sports car 
from that era doesn't really copy exactly any of the car but if you look at the Renault two-seaters or roadsters from 1904 to 1907 you find the same uh, shape it is almost certainly a Renault that you see in a poster above the garage uh, so uh, of course uh, it, it was a Frenchman shooting this so what are the themes the automobile attracting attention being its own star a star uh, by itself and the car being a disruptive technology of course with a comical or a comedic spin added to it in fact you can see that this is a professional that this is someone who had already an understanding of films that is rarely found during this period because he picked a pattern that is subtly replicated through the movie which is something that we discussed even in reference to Bumblebee repetition and variation are the basis for a big budget commercial movie in uh, Hollywood as well plus some big scene so what is the pattern the narrative pattern every time you see a peaceful scene normal people being productive going about their social life then there is the arrival of the car that attracts the attention of the people then there is some kind of disruption or confusion that follows the arrival of the car after the car is left we still see some of the scene because the confusion continues so in a way with this comical twist we also see a negative representation of the car oftentimes you see the use of the fade or dissolve technique going from one scene to the next which was another advanced kind of technique that Méliès perfected okay so let me go to YouTube Try 105, maybe 110. This is almost normal, almost as it should be. And I don't remember if this is at music, probably doesn't have any music. I don't want to stop it now. So, this is what was shot probably in a theater. And of course, the bigger man with the helmet is the, the, with, with the driver's um, beret is the king of Belgium. You see, this was an artist from the period, and his piece was all based on this prop that allowed him to incline and of course you have to imagine seeing this from the audience at that level you don't even see the tracks that he's using to get these strange inclinations okay so there they go but you see the aftermath every time you see a little bit of the aftermath this is the garage over there is the Renault the race car on top of the garage and of course you can see very simple background like a theater would do Soldiers, everything is choreographed, right? The way they march, regular people going by, but the car is being expected, so there is this excitement, and here it comes being pushed <laughs> into the scene, um, and they get off, and this is the refueling of this chain with tin cans of, of gas during the period gas would come into a tin can. Oftentimes, you wouldn't find a pump 
uh, during this period, they would sell you a tin can with a seal to show it was not tampered with, it was not watered down, some would do that, and then you would have to put it, uh, put it in yourself. Now, more attention and therefore more confusion to follow. They're cranking up the car. Notice the policeman behind it, but they put the wrong gear in. And it's flattened. And this is where the substitution happens. You just saw it. And the policeman body is being replaced by this, just the clothes, right? To show that it's well, completely flattened. It's exaggerated farcical kind of comedy. And of course, what, what would you do to save the guy? Take a pump and inflate him with air. But once you know the gag, you know how it will end. You start pumping air and the body will eventually explode because of too much air. Yes? Um, comparing to like normal gasoline, um, what is, what's the negative effect of the watered down gasoline? Oh no, you, you, if, if there is too much water, then the engine will stall on the road. And then you have to suck out of the engine everything and run, uh, uh, and, and run it again with, with pure gasoline. But we know anecdotally that people would be cheated that way. So they've left and, and the scene, the confusion continues. This is one again, of, of several explosions you see in every one. Yes. Now, as I said before, this is like animation. They're going up and down the hills. They're in such huge, again, the Alps are not in between Paris and the French Riviera. But they're a picturesque scenario. So they go there as well. And there we go. And again, <laughs> it's, the scene is, is seamless but the body is being replaced at some point with a puppet and then replaced with a human body again, but done careful enough to mask it. And you see the fading? Now these, these are Alps, even though you have to deviate from your itinerary to see the Alps before the French Riviera. You have to go east towards Switzerland, towards Geneva to do that, but why not? And almost like animation, and you see the fading again. And this is the custom gate. Octroi is the name of these uh, places where your merchandise would be checked. And of course, you have regular people doing the regular thing, and they're good people. The disruption will happen just with the car. Before the car, everything is fine and dandy, life is serene, uh, they, they like round women. And now we have the officer with a big belly, uh, pushing his belly against everyone, putting everyone in place to ensure order. They try to do that with the car. And of course, first they get some results, but now, poof, no, the third time. So they try again to stop the car. And there is the, the belly has exploded. And you see the aftermath of this and fading into the next scene, the open air market on the sea. So we're in the French Riviera. Again, serene activities by the civilian population. And then fear because the car is coming, distraction. And following this, you have this melee, you have this riot that takes place because people are trying to steal the uh, vegetables and the fruit, okay? And on and on they go, amplification, exaggeration. Now we get to another town and people are going about their life again and then they're scared and then distraction will follow because the car will not stop. So they crash through a gate, roofs come down, they get up the roof all together just to show, again, serene civilian life, and the car will arrive and crash everything. And still, after the car has left, you see more of this. Now, 
a, a road is being created in here. And of course, you see the palms to show again that we're in the French Riviera. People are working, are joking, they're trying to be productive. They're calling in this cart with the hot tar. Tar is not exactly like asphalt, but similar. And it's a real cart, right? The cart is real, but the uh, container is, is B-dimensional, right? It's flat and painted. And of course, some gags have little to do with the car. The tar will go out one time, a second time, because everything has to be extended and stretched. And all of a sudden, of course, the scene will be ruined by the car with another explosion. Fading, see? And there we go. So, somersaults. And of course, the aftermath of the destruction, even after the car has left. Nothing is like it was before. Fading into the arrival in Monte Carlo. So, it's like, at this point, it's like a race to have a control gate with people on the stand waiting for this event they're being entertained there are programs being sold or, or some other news flyer about the event and they're all pretty much in a peaceful normal condition until the car arrives to disrupt this even music and entertainment for the people who were waiting for the car. And, and now we know there is more excitement, we know the car is about to arrive, but the car won't stop. More distraction going up the stand, going in the air, being replaced by the actual model in a seamless way, and then finally the king and the mechanician get off the car. And will be welcomed by, by the people. No, actually they don't get off the car. Okay, there it was. <clears throat> Go back. Any questions or comments about this particular film before we talk about the next one? Okay, so the next two actually are from the same director and are variations on the same kind of story. The first one, which is the shortest, only a couple of minutes long, is the question mark motorist. The director of both is Walter Booth. Uh, both Booth and Méliès uh, had worked in theater and particularly as, as stage magicians. They were aware of the techniques used by theater magicians. Uh, magicians were a very popular kind of show in theaters during that period in Europe and other places in the world. They were aware of the tricks the magicians would use to make things appear and disappear and try to apply some of those tricks and moreover the attitude of the magician to hide their tricks in their films. Okay, So in uh, the question mark uh, uh, motorist, you have situations that are familiar, having seen the previous film, uh, a policeman on the road is trying to stop a couple that is going about in their car. Uh, the car doesn't stop because the car never stops in these films. The policeman ends up on board the car, then is uh, run over by the car, chases after the car, and all of a sudden the car becomes a kind of magical device similar to what you found in the science fiction novels of Jules Verne. The car will first go up a building, of course being replaced by a prop in a seamless 
way with, with editing, and then up the skies. Eventually, the car will come down and crash into a tribunal where another driver, automobile driver, is being tried because they're all destructive, right? They're all terrible criminals. They get out of, of, the, tri of, of the tribunal, of the court, they are being chased again, and finally they get to them. But the moment the policeman is about to arrest the couple, magically the car turns into a carriage with two horses. So the policeman and the others think that they have made a mistake, that they're not the same couple. They let them go after they've uh, gone, they're, they're gone just for a few feet. The, car, the, the carriage turns in itself into a car again, because it's all about these tricks, which, done well as they were, would have astonished the audience <coughs> of the period. Of course, it's, it, it feels childish to us, simply because we are used to high level, uh, uh, higher level of special effects, but they were effective at that time. So you'll find more about this. And it's again a trick film, all based on the special effects. The story is secondary. It's supposed to be a comedy. And the special effects employ a variety of techniques from miniature models to the use of editing in the stop, gap trick, or the substitution splice, the superimposition where you, you put two films together. And stop motion is where you take a picture of a prop just for one shot, one frame, then you move the prop slightly, you take another frame, and at the end, when you have all those frames together, it looks like animation. The backgrounds, some of the scenes are in real life, outside, other scenes are uh, set in a theatrical way, and of course, there is a certain pace or, or speed and, and comicity comedy is based on amplification. The themes are the magical qualities of the car, the way that the car is dominating its environment, right, cannot be stopped, and also how the car separates you from the rest of the world. The car is able to redefine space to go on the stars, on the clouds, etc. And being on the car, being on this journey at speed becomes its own condition, right? It's a new dimension. It's not a transition going from one place to another. It's being, living at speed, at a fast speed. And of course, there is a little bit of class ideology, the, the rich owners and the peasants, the policemen at work in this as well. As I said, it's only a couple of minutes. Now, this had some music, so let me see, let me make sure I can. Let's see if I can fix the sound. It's always problematic. This is it. There it is, the policeman trying to stop the couple, taking it off. At this point, it turns into a puppet, but you haven't seen it. It's so seamless you don't see it. And then it turns again into a human body, chases after them, and from being outside, we go into of superimposed films, so you have a prop imposed on the actual building. And they continue up the skies, because a car can drive anywhere, on the clouds, on the stars, to the moon. Oh. 
and they go around the rings of Saturn, which was repeated as a situation and expanded in the next movie by Booth into the tribunal. And again, you recognize from the way it's stressed that that is a driver with the kind of heavy fur coat used by automobile drivers during that period. So he's being tried. He behaves the same way, in a criminal way. There it is. Again, the superimposed car, right? You saw it. Um, and now they're being chased and they stop. The policeman is there to arrest them. Notice also this woman appeared from nowhere. And now you see, without any, it's very seamless, the car turns into a carriage, but now it turns again into an automobile that has been fooled and they chase back. And that's it. That was the whole movie. So this was successful. So Booth redid it, repeated some of the situations with the automatic motorist which is the story of a married couple that visits an inventor and the inventor shows them in his lab this robotic chauffeur, this robotic automobile driver. Then they all get on this car, the married couple, the inventor, and of course the android, uh, the robot that is driving the car, but this robot is kind of a comedic engine of the story as well. So, among other things, he will hit first the groom, then he will hit, in this situation, the policeman who has stopped them for speeding. The policeman at this point chases after them, grabs the car, and, and, and there is a dog that grabs the policeman's ass, and they're dragged by the car, and of course you see the same kind of trick initially, is they body of the actual actor being replaced seamlessly by a puppet in the rest of the scenes. They travel many places, then they go up the sky, they go to the stars, they go to Saturn, but this time instead of just going around the rings of Saturn, they get into the planet. There they find an alien species living inside the planet. There the policeman is dropped, finally free, and he tries to interact with this alien species uh, who are, are trying to capture him and torment him. Then a fairy comes out because the alien species is very much like the Wizard of Oz. Uh, and, and they have a fairy, which, which supposedly is their queen, and the policeman flirts with the fairy while sitting on the rings of Saturn. The cars, meanwhile, has been traveling down, all the way down into Saturn. They get to the end of it, they get out, and they fall, they fall into the ocean. They go under the sea, where they see various species. From there, they fall into the sky. Don't ask me how you go from the ocean to the sky again, falling, but that's how it is. And then they uh, uh, finally come down in a comedic way, they're, they're hit, they're, they're, the entire car is coming down, they're hit by lightning, and then the bride of the groom are shot down by Hunter as if they were birds. The inventor as well comes to the ground and the bride and the groom go out walking because of course the automobile is too dangerous. You find some notes in here, but nothing that I haven't mentioned. Here we are. This is the lab of the inventor, and this is the humanoid, the robotic, made like a steampunk creation with cogwheels that drives the car. And of course, even though they make knees, he has knees, but he has to walk like this. So, because that's the stereotypical way to show that's a robot. There we go, the groom goes down. <clears throat> Again, those joints are not working. This is the car. I added links. If you want to know what the cars are, I added links where you can find all of the cars. 
their, their name, model, brand, etc. So they all get on the car, the robotic driver turn the car so that goes into gear and, and here they go. The policeman is trying to stop them, but things don't go as planned. First, the robo driver stops, but then here it goes, just hits the policeman, and then they are trying to stop the policeman, the inventor, and the groom, and then they put him in the back, they, they handcuff him to the back, right? And there we go, the, the dog, Okay, now the dog has finally grabbed the ass. Didn't succeed the first few times. And here they go, and they're going very slowly to allow the actor to follow. And now they're going very fast, and it's a puppet with a puppet of the dog. And they're swerving, they're going. And here we go, they're going round, round. And this is pretty much the, the speed of the film, right? In this case, I didn't have to speed it up. They go up a building, as you've seen in the previous film by the same director. They go to the moon, and then to Saturn. Here we are. That's a bigger model, but it's all props. Then they decide to go inside. Not right away, everything has to be stretched, right? Yeah, we are, and that's the people who live inside Saturn. In these caves, underground caves. And you can recognize the same kind of presentation of ma magical species that you would have found in Wizard of Oz later on. Here comes the car with the policeman, and finally, he's free. But his problems are not over because the locals want to take him prisoner. And they're poking him. They're going out. Why not? It's a very precarious kind of platform. They didn't put enough wood. And there it is, the, the fairy, the fairy who controls the little people of Saturn, and they're flirting. While the car is going down to the bottom of the inner world of Saturn until they come out and they start falling and you see the car being imposed on another background. They get into a geyser. And then into the ocean and they see various monstrous creatures And again, you have the superimposition of different films to obtain this kind of effect. Here they come. And the actors are simulating being underwater, doing like this. Now they're in the sky, night sky with a storm and they're hit by lightning. And of course, all of these effects are produced simply with editing. Finally struck, 
and here comes the hunter. And again, you go from the puppet to the body with the editing. And then she says, well, it's not just the two of us, bring down my husband as well. Here he comes with an umbrella, big clownish bow tie, and they leave because they leave on foot because the car is too dangerous. Okay, so the next two films are from 1913, and you'll see that they're closer to a modern film in that you finally have a story with some twists and not just special effects. Barney Oldfield is in the title because he was one of the most famous race drivers, race car drivers in the US during that time. And he collaborated with various productions, especially during the period when he was banned from racing because he was too aggressive on the racetrack, endangering the lives of other drivers. Barney would also appear on the stage of theaters. They would invite him for plays that were performed on a stage, and sometimes they would put an actual car on the stage with Barney, and they would pay him incredible amounts of money just to be there because his presence as a celebrity would attract a lot of viewers. In this case, as you find here, it is almost indispensable to put the speed at least at 1.2 because otherwise you don't get what the accurate pace would have been uh, during that period. The actors were all famous. Max Sennett played a lot of parts. He was also a successful and prolific Director. In this case, he plays the part of the young lover who's defined by the cards with the text, the bashful suitor. Mabel Normand was one of the most famous actresses from the period, very active in the 1910s and, and the first few years in the 1920s. And she often played parts of characters with her own name. So you'll see that in this film, in the next, she plays the part of Mabel. Fort Sterling, another popular actor, was, plays the part of the evil guy who's trying to kidnap, who, who's trying to take away and then manages to kidnap Mabel after Mabel and Mac have established a relationship and Mac is shown his finger to signify that they're going to get engaged. Ford uh, uh, kidnaps Mabel, Mabel ends up chained to the ra ra railroad tracks, and then Ford, uh, with a, a couple of accomplices, uh, gets away with a handcart, one of those things you see in the period, of, in the period movies from this era, uh, a, a cart that goes on a, on a railroad track with just manual strength force. Uh, they get to the station, they steal a locomotive engine in order to go back and crash poor Mabel, who's still there chained. Uh, the people from the station uh, alert Max Sennett that uh, her lo his love is there about to be destroyed by the train and he sees a car, uh, uh, a, a powerful car uh, by the side of the road because Barney has stopped to flirt with a local woman and he asks Barney to race the train, beat the train, get to the place where Mabel is chained before the train and you have this trope. You have two tropes. One, the woman chained to the railroad track, which we preceded the automobile. It was uh, uh, presented in theaters in the, in the 19th century. And then the other trope is the car trying to get to a place faster than the train, which also had variations during that period, car versus plane. For example, Barney Oldfield himself uh, toured when he was banned from racing he toured the united states going to small towns um, with someone else with a plane and they would stage a race between the car and the plane and they made a lot of money that way if there was a local horse racetrack they would use that 
and the car would go around and the plane would also try to go around. It was a biplane, one of those planes with two wings, one on top of each other. Of course, Barney and the lover managed to free Mabel in time and you have this special effect of the train that comes within an inch of Mabel before they take her off the tracks. And after Mabel has been saved, of course, love can triumph, but more importantly, evil has to perish. So first there is a confrontation between Fort Sterling and the police. He kills several policemen coming there with a handcart themselves. Then he tries to shoot himself. The uh, gun misfires, doesn't work. And he tries to strangle himself and finally has a heart attack and dies. Okay, that's the film. I believe this one is about six minutes or so, but we have to adjust the speed. Okay, so let me, whoa, where did it go? Okay, let me adjust the speed. other right you should understand from this scene that they meet but they're already falling in love with each other again it's like a ballet it is choreographed that's why it is physical comedy and this time she's not going to escape
there at the appointment. Doesn't know what happened to her. So you see, it's more articulated as a story, much more articulated compared to the others. Again, falls always in the same manner, which would make the audience laugh. to go get the train themselves. Bye. 
car is passing the train going faster. train coming, superimposed with the other scene, right? The train is not really there. It's two films together. from the same period, the Speed Kings, with some of the same people. Mabel, again, plays the part of the character of a daughter of a millionaire. This millionaire played by Ford Sterling, who's Papa, but a kind, again, a kind of bad character, because he's trying to force Mabel to marry Earl Cooper, who's a driver, a Speed King from the title, and is a wholesome American boy driving a Stutz, a, an American car, whereas Mabel, has fallen in love with Teddy, who is driving a Fiat. He doesn't look American, he looks imported, and he's driving a Fiat. So that's, that, that will tell you that it's not 100% made in the US. And um, Ford is not only uh, uh, bad with his daughter, but argues for no clear reason with Roscoe, who was another famous comedian from the time, very uh, popular with the nickname of Fatty, which of course he hated himself, but that's how he was advertised, and he plays the part of a racetrack official. And again, it's just, the part with Roscoe Arbuckle is just there to provide slapstick comedy. They're fighting physically, but it's like ballet. Again, the way they both fall down, it was really choreographed. At the end of the story, the awesome American boy will win the race because, of course, that's destiny, right? But Teddy will win the heart of Mabel. So Mabel will go away with Teddy while her father is uh, rolling on the ground and having a physical fight with the racetrack official. Okay? We'll see this and then we'll leave. Remember that I will not be in my office after this class, because I have a meeting. Here's Mabel. And Teddy and the other driver were both real-life drivers playing themselves. Even the names are the actual names to attract people. That's the Fiat of Teddy. Fiat's were very popular and won a lot of races during that period. Usually they had huge engines, and you'll see this one also has a monster of an engine. Look how tall the engine is. And that's the father. He's playing the part of the evil guy here too. He's trying to poison the car in some way. Not, not very clear. Bye. 
Barney was also appearing in Hammy or not playing a big part. has a mechanician on board because that's how they race because the mechanician actually had to take care of a few things while the driver was racing including looking for the other cars spotting for the driver and here comes the long prolonged fight with Arbuckle see how Arbuckle fall, fell again jumping up in the air, as I said, choreographed. Look how this, this engine is like five feet and a half from the ground. And you can still find some of these cars. If you're interested, you should look for a video called The Beast of Turin, which is a restored Fiat from this period, which is owned by a British collector. And it's a monster, and, and the, so the noise is incredible. Because the cars from this period are not muffled. Car is over. The winner is the American boy. So he's supposed to get the girl, but she doesn't want to. She's just there to congratulate him. from the 1910s and then his career ended in the 1920s because of this of a scandal. See, it's like clowns in a circus. Right? Oh. He 
was good. And at this point, he was still young, so he still had to come up with a few more tricks. <laughs>